Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I just want to take a second to welcome everyone to the second day of Allies' annual Civil Military Relations Conference uh, and the stage topic on Civil Military Relations and Disaster Relief. My name is Will Beckham. I'm a senior here at Tufts, and I want to take a second to apologize for my voice for a second. Um, we had a great first. We had a great first day, and uh, uh, we're really excited for our panel today. One of the main focuses of our conference. Uh, Allies was founded in 2006 with the goal of bringing people together from across the civil military divide to discuss how we can approach complex problems in the world together and how we might best do that and where in the world we might be doing that successfully and where we might be doing it, where we might have some uh, room for improvement. Um, and disaster relief is really is a, is really a place where you see really the full spectrum, really the full spectrum of uh, actors across the civil military divide. Um, so we're really excited to have a panel here today where we're going to be talking about issues like uh, running joint operations, um, the appropriateness of militaries being involved in humanitarian aid, um, and uh, working, acro working across different organizational cultures, different organizational structures, uh, things like that in order to get the job done, in order to mitigate uh, natural the effects of natural disasters as effectively and as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Um, so I'm really, really excited to be joined here by our great panel today. Uh, we're joined first uh, by uh, uh, Michael, Mr. Michael Marks, uh, uh, from the uh, U uh, United Nations Office of the Coordination for Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance. Uh, we have Mr. Yoni Bach, uh, who is, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I'll go, go down the line. Uh, <laughs> not the order in which you're speaking. Uh, Ms. Misha Shattuck, who is a staff researcher at MIT Lincoln Lab. We have Mr. Sean Horgan, who is, a, uh, is the uh, New England director of Team Rubicon, as well as a former Marine Corps platoon sergeant. Uh, we have Mr. Yoni Bach, who is a, uh, of the, um, the uh, uh, USAID's Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance in the Civil Military Coordination uh, Office. And finally, we have uh, Colonel Wiley Thompson, who is in the chair of the Geography and Environmental Engineering Department at West Point, as well as a U.S. Army aviator. Uh, really excited to have everyone here. Um, I'd just like to point out real quick uh, that uh, Mr. Bach is actually a graduate of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, so go Tufts, and that uh, Colonel Thompson is a graduate of the United States Military Academy, so go West Point. So uh, we'll be starting with uh, we'll be we'll be uh, going down the, we'll go, be going down going down to the panelists, and uh, afterwards we'll try and bring the discussion together a little bit, and then uh, we'll open the discussion up to the audience and try and bring the audience in together as well. So, uh, without further ado, Mr. Michael Marks. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me in the back? Probably more than you wanted to. Um, <laughs> actually, yeah, one of those yeah. has to go off. All right. Try it again. Okay. Um, I'm Mike Marks. I am the Senior Civil Military Coordination Advisor at the United Nations Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And I drew the short slide also. I am starting off uh, this morning's panel. But I wanted to just talk about a few concepts within international disaster relief, the role of the military, and just some personal experiences. Because I've been watching this now for almost 30 years first in uniform, and then at USAID's Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, and then most recently, since 2006, in the United Nations, working for OCHA. And for those of you who are not aware of what OCHA does, we're a small organization, about 2,200 worldwide, including about 40 country offices, uh, nine regional offices, uh, and two headquarters, one in New York and one in Geneva, and all of you in the the academy should understand how stupid it is to have two headquarters. <laughs> yeah, trying to figure out who's in charge. Um, our responsibility is primarily to coordinate the overall relief community. So that is not only the UN humanitarian agencies, but also the non-governmental organizations, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, and then any other actors that come into a disaster, whether they are military or civilian, civil defense, um, civil protection, or other. That is coordinate, but not coordinate. That is coordinate with them, not coordinate. Because one thing you have to understand about the way the humanitarian and the disaster relief community works, it is not directive. 
So we don't have any directive authority. We can't tell the World Food Program that they have to do something, or UNICEF, or any NGO that they have to do something. We set the conditions so that coordination is in everybody's best interest. Because if we can all move together in the same direction, then we're much better off. Keep in mind that coordination is a voluntary activity. Most humanitarian organizations agree to coordinate because it's in their best interest, because they get something out of it. Other humanitarian organizations, especially NGOs, may decide to go their own way and not coordinate within the, the overall structure. So we don't have the authority, we don't have the power to say, you must do this. We can beg, we can plead, we can try to shame organizations to, to doing the right thing. As far as civil military coordination, this is a massively important topic for us in the UN, especially for OCHA. We have the mandate to be the focal point for the entire humanitarian community for humanitarian civil military coordination. So we set up coordination structures on behalf of the humanitarians. It is a core competency of all of our humanitarian affairs officers, so anytime you read an OCHA representative in the field, they should have the skills to set up the dialogue, set up the information sharing um, between the military and the humanitarians. This has changed. It wasn't always this way. And I would say that the tsunami was kind of the benchmark which shifted the mentality of the humanitarian community in from what <coughs> my thing to do with the military to one of <coughs> reluctance to one of military has a critical role, especially in natural disaster response, and we need to do the best that we can to coordinate to make that capability, those assets, which are only there for a short amount of time, as effective and as efficient as possible. So if you look post-2005, virtually every major disaster, whether it was the Pakistan earthquake, the Pakistan floods, the Haiti earthquake, the Philippine response uh, to Typhoon Haiyan, there has been a very close coordination between military and, and civilian actors. Um, some of the problems, because can't all can't all be rosy. Um, we still get military assets that are available instead of what is required on the ground. We've never had an issue where we didn't have enough military assets. The issue that we always have is we don't have the right kind. Of so when you all become commanders, engineers, engineers, and engineers, that's what is needed in natural disaster response, along with logisticians, because a natural disaster response is a giant logistics effort. You're just moving stuff from point A to point B, whether it is material, food, water, um, personnel, people, it's about logistics. But before you do that, you have to get the humanitarian infrastructure in place. Roads have to be cleared, bridges have to be built, the airport needs to be rehabilitated and, and managed, ports have to be re uh, reconfigured. So all of these things are important. Um, we work primarily with kind of a core group of nations that deploy military assets to emergencies. Generally, you'll see there's somewhere between 20 and 28 militaries that will deploy military, or nations that will deploy military assets to a natural disaster. Of that, generally seven or eight of them will put boots on the ground. And the one that puts the boots on the ground the most is the United States. The US is the most likely to deploy military assets. It has the global reach, and it has a more agile decision-making process at the strategic level to get um, those forces in place quickly. Usually, the US gets there on day three, day four of a disaster. For the rest of the world, it's generally peaks around day 12. If you think about how much suffering there is, even in that three-day period after a earthquake or after a typhoon, a flood event, um, military are not first responders in that sense. First responders are the local populations, it's neighbors helping neighbors, it's neighbors digging their colleagues and their friends out of rubble um, and family. Um, 
Another problem we have is transition. So once the military comes in, how do they get out in a seamless way? Because from the humanitarian side, we generally don't transition from military capability to civilian capability very well. We become over-dependent and we become over-reliant. One of the problems that we always have is even if the military tells us for a month that we're leaving on November 15th, we're going to wake up on November 15th and ask where the helicopters went. We're just not that good at doing that planning and putting things into place. So transition periods are always um, a, a difficult time. Information sharing is always the foundation of the relationship between military and uh, humanitarian actors. If we can talk on the ground, for the most part, everybody is a rational, logical person, and personal motivations, regardless of how you got there, regardless of if you were there because of political decision, or if you're there because it's your mandate from a humanitarian side, on the ground, people are there to help people in need. So information sharing, talking through the issues is a huge uh, piece of it. Natural disasters and complex emergencies are very different. So in conflict situations, the relationship between humanitarians and military is going to be far different than it is in a natural disaster. Each emergency is context specific. So we may be able to walk hand in hand in a natural disaster, work together, make things transparent that it's one operation, but in a conflict, in a complex emergency, whether that's Central African Republic or South Sudan or Syria or any number of places going on right now, that relationship is going to be more distant. So don't get frustrated that you know, if you were in a Philippines response type event, where you work very closely with humanitarian or military actors, then you transition to Syria or Somalia, that that relationship is going to be different. It's going to be context specific. Um, finally, I just want to say that this community is very personality driven. And as much as we want structures put in place, it really is about the personalities. And so what you do and how you engage, how you share information, how you're perceived, is going to follow you through that community. There are humanitarian colleagues that I met 1991 in northern Iraq, from 93 in Mogadishu, that I saw on the ground in the Philippines. And that shared experience from 20 years ago, we've kind of grown up through the system together. And it makes it easier to have that trust and to build rapport and, and know who to call for what. But keep in mind, it is very personality dependent. So if you do well in one response, chances are then that is going to help you in future responses. But conversely, that's, that may be a problem. I think I'll leave it there, um, just to give the other panelists an opportunity. Marks, I uh, appreciate that, uh, and, and uh, I know also neglected to mention that uh, uh, Mr. Marks is a, a veteran of both uh, the U.S. Army Civil Affairs and Special Forces, and is also um, a former member of uh, the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance at USAID, uh, through which he uh, deployed with um, uh, disaster, <coughs> excuse me, uh, disaster assistance response teams on, on uh, 12 different uh, natural disasters. So thank you again, Mr. Marks, for your, for your remarks. Uh, next we have Mr. Yoni Bach. Next, we have Mr. Yoni Bach uh, joining us from uh, USAID's uh, Office of uh, Foreign Disaster Assistance in the Civil Military uh, Liaising Department. And uh, Mr. Bach, Mr. Bach joins us uh, he, where he, uh, uh, as a graduate of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, as I said, as well as a uh, um, graduate of McGill University. Um, he currently uh, helps facilitate the Joint Humanitarian Operations course uh, that, uh, for, the, for USAID that runs jointly between uh, USAID and the military. Uh, and also has deployed on the on the disaster assistance response team um, as a civil military coordinator for the, the joint support force. 
He's been previously assigned to the Pentagon and to CENTCOM in Tampa, Florida, and uh, um, will be uh, joining us in, after uh, the panel today to discuss uh, the process the processes and protocols through which uh, USAID liaisons with the military uh, to uh, um, uh, better coordinate natural disaster response. So thank you very much, Mr. Bach, and uh, we look forward to what you have to say. All right. Um, well, thank you for being here. Um, and it's actually, uh, thank you for convening this as well, because this is a great opportunity to get all these people together in one room. Um, as I think you saw as we put as you put this together, um, there is a community of practitioners working on civ mill and disaster relief. This is a very unique mission set. It's a special mission set, and to be honest, it's a great mission set to do, right? It makes us feel good, right? We're not being sent in to bang down walls or to take over a country. We're going in actually to help, to save lives, and that is an incredible opportunity that we have. That's also our biggest challenge, because this is a mission set where we're trying to help, and if we don't do it right, we actually end up hurting. We end up delaying. At best, we waste a lot of resources. At worst, we make the situation untenable and much harder for the people on the ground. And we can see that a lot of times. If you look at Haiti now, it's not any better than it was beforehand. There's still the same issues. So understanding the mission set is really critical. And as you go forward in your career, understand the mission. Characterize the operating environment. It's going to be nine-tenths of any work you do. So what I want to do here, last night Dr. Shear talked about the strategic level, how the policy is set up with USAID as the federal lead for foreign disaster relief. It's USAID. It's not state. We hold the baton for that, and the director of the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance is the authorized to be the president's special coordinator for foreign disaster relief. So that means when the military comes in, they don't do it by themselves. They do it in support of USAID. They will never be on scene first to render aid without us playing a part to approve that, to request that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that middle operational level, and in the breakout session, maybe dig a little more into tactics. So OFTA, the Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance, is an office that was 50 years old that was created out of some of the confusions that arose in various disaster responses in the 1960s. <laughs> From our get-go, we've been Civ Mill. Our earliest disasters in Costa Rica and in Skopje, in uh, what, was then, uh, what was then Yugoslavia, today's Macedonia, involved the military. So we've been working on this for a long time. But really, as uh, Mike was saying, it's in the past 10, 15 years, as DOD mission sets have evolved, post-Iraq, post-Afghanistan, we've really started deepening the, uh, the relationship and fleshing out our civ mill team to the point where we now have operational advisors stationed at each of the geographic combatant commands. OFTA, as the federal lead, plays six roles, five roles, my apology. First of all, we are the lead coordinator. We're not OPCON. We don't come in directive and issue orders. We come in to coordinate, to convene actors. We also deploy to provide the on-scene management. So the first US boots on the ground effectively come out of the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. But in most countries, we have an embassy. So obviously, there's a little bit of pre-awareness before we get there. We're going to be doing a lot of the resource provision, money, commodities, teams. The DART that was mentioned before will be coming out of our office. Urban search and rescue teams will be coming out of our office. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, when they deployed in Japan, they come through our system. Right now. HHS out in West Africa is coming as part of the DART. That's a platform that we have to deploy people, to deploy other US government assets out in the field. We're going to be doing a lot of the assessments. Right? Some will be firsthand. We'll send our staff out to do assessments. But a lot of that is going to be working with the other humanitarian actors to pull together needs assessments and then report on that. And we're going to be capturing for the record what the US government did. How much money are we providing as US government? What was our mission set? What was it? How's the coordination going? We're going to be doing a lot of that reporting. So I know at West Point, at, there's a lot of discussion about leadership, right? For us, when we talk leadership, we're not talking directive. We're not talking formal control. We're talking about convening actors towards a common purpose, deconflicting, if you will, and basically defining what our objective is. And that's really the challenge in the humanitarian mission set, right? There's a lot of needs all over the world. You go into a country, and there's tons of stuff to do that was there before the disaster. It'll be there after the disaster. Our challenge is to say, what is our mission? Not what can we do, because we're the US government. We can do lots of things all over the world. It's what should we do? What do we have to do? And that's, that's where we come in as the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, giving DOD its mission. Here's what you're going to do, and that's not what you're going to do. And, and navigating and negotiating, taking into account all of the political and strategic objectives that come behind us. So 
five takeaways. How do we actually do this in practice? So as Mike mentioned, coordination, communication, that's the, that's the baseline. We have to be talking to one another. It means understanding one another's systems. It means speaking the same language. We know that military is different than civilian ease, and a military officer and a human rights or humanitarian practitioner aren't necessarily going to see eye to eye. We have to be able to cut through that level and understand the operating environment and where we're coming from. We have to be sharing information. Right? DOD sometimes shares information, but a lot of stuff is on a SIPR or a JWIC side, and you know it's it's close hold. Right? So you have to be sharing that. We're going to actually have the clearances to get in the door and say, okay, let's let's talk in practicality with you know what is actually we're talking about at a high level. Ideally, we're going to work on classified, but if we need to, we'll work in a classified system. We're part of the U.S. government. We're going to be linking personnel and liaison relationships and advisory relationships. A lot of training, which was mentioned in the Joint Humanitarian Operations course, is a baseline for understanding these operations. And, and this is the kicker, we're going to be planning together. We're going to be reviewing op boards. We're going to be approving frag orgs. We're going to basically be the ones making sure that orders are written in such a way that it reinforces a supporting, supported relationship. Because that's critical. Right? The military, at the end of the day, is always going to be the military, but it basically doesn't sneeze unless someone orders it. Right? There's no, there's no leeway there. That's the beauty of the U.S. military. That's why we can do this job. We can't with the humanitarian community. Right? That's very personality dependent. You know, well, it's the whims of whoever the team lead happens to be. Not, the military is different. There is a chain of command. So we have to influence at the right node within the chain of command, and we know that it'll ricochet down. So that's the first takeaway: communication link personality. The second one is also a big one: understand the mission what the mission is, what the mission isn't, right? So what does that mean? Dr. Shear talked about some of the criteria that the US military gets involved with, right? Unique capability. What is it uniquely suited to do? Now, that's one of those vague terms that we like to throw around, and it means whatever I think it means at the end of the day. But understand that there's going to be a bookend, a right and a left to the mission. Unique is going to be based on time constraints. It's going to be based on available budget, available assets. And frankly, what's understood that the humanitarian community can't provide. It's going to make sure that the assistance is appropriate. It's scaled. It's wholesale. It's not retail. The picture last night about with the uh, officer handing out a MRE or an HDR, humanitarian daily ration, to uh, two individuals in, in Port-au-Prince in Haiti. You know, from the humanitarian standpoint, we don't throw up our arms and say, oh, this is awful. How could they be doing that, right? permissive environment. But we do look at that, as Dr. Scheer pointed out, and say, you know, something's not right here. That's, that's not the appropriate way that U.S. military actually should be interacting in a humanitarian environment. This isn't a stability operation. This is a foreign disaster relief operation. So we're going to be talking about pulling in assets, pulling in, not what do I have in my arsenal that I could push in, because we can do a lot, what's the requirement that I have to pull in? And that's going to take time to get there. Right? It's not going to be first day. Right? We are not, the international community is not the 911 ambulance service for the world. Not because we don't want to be, it's because we can't. There's logistical constraints. We don't, we're not first on scene, ever. Maybe domestically, different responsibilities. But internationally, we're going to be coming after there's sort of an assessment of what we could be doing that makes sense. And the final piece in here is understanding that because we can do it, doesn't mean there's a requirement to do it. When we don't respond in a disaster, that's a good thing. Right? When we don't have to send assets, personnel, money, that's good. It means that the country is able to respond and address the needs. We might want to respond because we have a strategic political goal. Oh, this will increase how they love the U.S. No. No, that's not where it's going to come about. Not in a disaster relief environment. It's understanding that we're going to put in what we have to do, what the requirement is to do, not what we can do. All right. Third takeaway. Third, how it works operationally. Um, talked yesterday, Dr. Shear talked about validating the mission. Right? A mission essentially is tasked to the operating force. So understanding that you can make all sorts of decisions about we, what, what, what we should or what we could do, but someone has to be calling the shots about what we are going to do. And that's our job. So we are going to develop a mission validation process. That's also going to give you a sense of progress towards end state. because That's the fourth takeaway. Planning for the end at the beginning. And you only plan for the end when you've defined your mission narrowly. So you go into a humanitarian environment, there are gobs of needs. There's needs for food and shelter and water. There's needs for protection. And when humanitarians say protection, they mean essentially looking at vulnerability, not physical security or site protection. 
There are going to be needs for food security. There are going to be needs for reconstruction. And if you keep dialing back or peeling back the onion, at the end you're going to talk about problems of governance and issues of economic development and other issues that are far outside of the humanitarian disaster relief world. So we have to be thinking about how we limit it right from the get-go. And part of that means trying to actually censor and edit out information. I know this is sort of counterintuitive because we think we want all this information. The problem is too much information actually overwhelms the system. Our challenge is to focus, and that means also defining what we're not doing. And the final piece here, and I'll wrap up here and, and pass the baton, is really to think about this as a whole of government, as a US government. right? In contrast to the humanitarian community writ large, which has lots of different nodes, right? lots of different actors with no centralized C2, there's no one person in charge. right? So it's really hurting cats in a very challenging way. As the US government, we do have systems. We do have processes. We do have authorities. And even though a disaster has happened, we don't lose sight of those. And that's when those are all the more important, to recognize that the systems are designed exactly for those times when they're being challenged. So we do work with a supporting supported. We do work on the basis of statutory authority or authority delegated down to a commander. Money that's appropriated for emissions. That's our limit as the US government. And we can't lose sight of that. So it's not about what we want to do, because as humans, right, we're all individuals. We wear a couple hats in, in all of this. Right, as the individual hat, I want to go out and do all. But as the institutional hat, which I can't lose sight of, I have a very focused mission set. And so that's really where the Civ Mill conversation goes when we talk disaster relief. Right, taking this great mission set and really making sure that we understand each of our roles and responsibilities in it. And as Dr. Shear mentioned last night, and I wholeheartedly concurred, we have gotten a lot better at doing this. There are great examples of when it fell apart, of when you know NGOs, US government humanitarians would move things from point A to point B, and then that night the DOD JTF, Joint Task Force, would move it back from point B to point A, because we weren't synchronized, we weren't coordinated, right? We have those examples, we like to joke about them now, but we've gotten a lot better. Any recent response, Haiyan, Japan, the tsunami, um, even now in Iraq this past summer with the airdrops on Sinjar Mountain, that was coordinated through us. We requested that. And we were the ones who put the mechanism in motion to get that happening. And right now in West Africa as well. Very large footprint, nevertheless very well coordinated. So, it can happen, it does happen, but understanding the mission is critical. I'll wrap there and pass it back. Thank you very much, Mr. Bach. Uh, next, we have Colonel Wiley Thompson uh, from the U.S. Military Academy. Colonel Thompson is a uh, U.S. Army aviator with experience uh, par uh, participating in uh, the two uh, relief efforts to the uh, 2005 uh, floods in uh, Pakistan, uh, and is currently the head of the Environmental Engineering Department at West Point. Um, we're very pleased to have Mr. Th uh, Colonel Thompson here, and uh, let's give him a round of applause. Hey, I, you know, I like how Dr. Shearer kind of took that, that strategic, uh, you already brought us down operational. I'm going to talk to you all about really thinking tactically and maybe talk, some folks might think this is more of a rant when I'm done. Um, I'm really a nice guy, right, Kayla? I'd say so. I'm a <laughs> academic counselor, so she might have felt obligated to say that. Um, nah. She also went to second grade with my son. So, uh, I've got some mystery here. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, everything I'm going to offer you, so those in uniform, if you talk publicly, you got to put out the DOD disclaimer, right? Anything that I'm sharing today is based on my academic research, my personal experience, and my views, not the views of anybody who would be, uh, you know, uh, behind this uniform. So, um, all right, so we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, acting tactically, but I want you to think philosophically. The, the experience that, that is set up here this is, you know, most of you are undergrads, but this is this should be a graduate level experience for you. This is, should be a place where we push our assumptions and we question what we're hearing, and, and, and we learn and we take away and we think bigger. And that's what I that's what I want you to get out of that. Um, I'm I'm probably one of the more critical people of the military's role in humanitarian assistance or disaster response, who is currently working. 
and I'm critical because I think we can do it better, and I think we can get better, and and, and that's why. I've also had the opportunity, uh, the, ble the, the, the blessing, the opportunity to, to stay. Um, so some of this may feel like I'm, my rant is focused more on those in uniform, and, and it might be, uh, but uh, I think everybody here might be able to take something away, or, or at least I hope. Um, all right, first of all, hazards, disasters. Hazards are something that uh, could harm, something we, we like, uh, something beneficial to us or, or ourselves. Disasters are largely a social construct. <coughs> disasters, it becomes a disaster, a hazard becomes a disaster in, based on how we fail uh, to or inappropriately respond or prepare for whatever that event was. And sometimes when we talk about the, the lack of coordination, that is the inappropriate response that can make a disaster even worse than, than, than it would have been. So just, just want to kind of get that out. Uh, my experience started, uh, as an aviator, I've flown a lot, um, a lot of domestic stuff, search and rescue, motor vehicle accident, fighting fires, so the coordination elements, they're largely the same, but they're scaled up big time in, in, in a disaster, especially uh, in the foreign context. My, I kind of cut my teeth in Pakistan, so I'm six, seven months into fighting in Afghanistan, and Saturday morning, I'm in the headquarters, and like this table's kind of shaking, I'm like, well, it is a Saturday morning, but wait, we're dry, we're deployed, right? So it could be that. And I was like, it gotta be an earthquake. So we look up, it's an earthquake. Less than 48 hours later, myself, my ops, my operations officer, a fantastic guy, and my uh, logistician, non-commissioned officer, were dropped off in Chakala Air Base, which is a joint civil air base in, in Islamabad. And I'm like, other than the embassy folks, I'm kind of the first Marine go there. So it's less than 48 hours, by convenience, proximity and the stuff we had. Within eight hours, I had five aircraft, 100 people. It grew to 33 aircraft from four different countries, three different services, and about 500 people. So my, my job was to run the US military rotary aviation response to Operation Lifeline, the, the Pakistan Air Force. Um, and I'm a brand new lieutenant colonel. I don't know much at all about this whole humanitarian thing, other than what I've you know, seen on TV or, or read, have not been formally trained. The, the good news is, everything your mom taught you, and we have a mom in the room, right? <laughs> Shout out to mom. Um, everything, your, uh, everything your mom taught you will, will help you be good, good enough. But you need to become a student of your profession, especially in this area, if you want to be great. So you can sell for good. I commend, I ask you to be great, because, uh, you know, like Yoni said, you know, that, that three, three or so days until you get there and things get going, there's a kid underneath a pile of bricks that may or not be viable by the time we get to that, that little kid. So it'd be great. Um, the, uh, there's, there's a lot of well-intended people wearing all kinds of different clothes. Some logos, some not, uh, some host nation, some the, the guy that lives on the corner in the village that's that's received damage, um, the, the folks at the MC. Uh, but we, we're often uncoordinated. There's great duplicity of effort. Um, aid doesn't match need. Uh, and there are, there are even folks who have an agenda. Maybe they're placing the, uh, the profile of their donor above really kind of what should be done because high profile of the donor gets more money, they become more viable, and in the end state it may actually work out. Um, I, it is personality driven. The first guy, the first dark person I met was I just showed up in Pakistan, and then that night the dark team got there, and the guy said, and it wasn't near as nice. If it was Yoni, it would have been great. Um, wasn't near as nice. This guy said, if the first picture tomorrow morning is not a big pallet of aid with U.S. flags on it being pushed onto the back of a Chinook, you will suffer severe career implications. <laughs> <laughs> Joke's on you, not much of a career. Uh, so, you know, what's the song? Nothing, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> Anyways, uh, you know, and, and that's, so that's a personality driven. I was like, you know, is this guy? So you know, I dismissed him. Looked around, all like, I'm not in the airfield. There's no USA there yet. Um, not not USAID, but aid with from the people of the United States. And so it got there, you know. But you know, that that really wasn't productive. And then that's a personality piece that is very very important. Um, I commend you to be. I, I ask you to be a student of your profession. Fill the gaps that you have an experience with the words and experiences of others. So the rich experiences here, I mean, un un untold riches right here. Uh, Dr. Sher, what, what he brought. Um, read your doctrine, then read the heck out of the humanitarian literature. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention a couple pieces um, that I think. 
the, some of the humanitarian literature that I've read, I think it, it's helped me become a better person. It has helped me with my emotional intelligence, which as leaders we know is very, very important. Um, you know, like Dr. Walker, Peter Walker, who is the Rosenberg Chair for um, its nutrition and human security here. Mm -hmm. Right? He wrote, he wrote an article back in 1992, and it was called The Foreign Military Resources for Disaster Relief in NGO Perspective. And he said there are five questions to ask before we introduce military forces. Folks, that article is still as valid. Those questions are still as valid today. And you don't have to scramble to write it down. I'll, I'll share everything I'm saying in my notes. Also. Um, I'd rather you. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the community has become, of actors have become more diverse. Our situations are more complex. We mentioned you know, complex crises and, and emergencies. But those, some of the fundamentals are still the same. Uh, Mary Anderson's Do Not Harm, How Aid Can Support Peace and War. It's great. Uh, a time to listen. So the hearing, uh, hearing, of, hearing people on the, on the receiving end of international aid. It's, it was called the Listening Project. They went out and they surveyed 6,000 <coughs> recipients of aid. They said, are we doing it? And it's nice. It's iPadable. It's free. Uh, you can just read it while you're waiting for like a doctor's appointment. Read a couple you know, pages. And you hear these stories and you see how well we're doing. Hey, that's our constituency, right? And, and, and they're, they're kind of like rating us. You know, um, so that's a that's a great one. The Golden Fleece. So for maybe folks on the civilian side, I don't know how many have read that. Um, it, it's kind of controversial, but it's called the Manipulation and Independence of Humanitarian Action. And it says, hey, we've got these humanitarian the, these principles, these core values, but gosh, we all have to sort of bend to get what we need for those for those folks that that, that the recipients. Um, and then like. Uh, like Dr. Shearer's recommendation, the JTF Commander's Handbook. You know, you know that's great. Um, the uh, the Sphere Handbook. Put put it on your iPad. Everything I'm talking about can just sit on your iPad and wait and uh, wait for when it's needed. Uh, the USIP Interaction Guidelines for Civil Mill uh, Interaction. Uh, UNOCHA's the Oslo Guidelines. Right. And these are classic works that, that should be on your iPad, especially you Navy folks. You're so much more expeditionary than the rest of us. Um, the I, I spent some time in Haiti. Uh, also, so Pakistan, Haiti, I went down, I wore sort of civilianish clothes, and that's when you know, we ran into each other, though we didn't realize it was us. I think we've all gotten better looking since then, so obviously we didn't recognize each other. Um, the, uh, and I, I, I spent a lot of time standing outside the wire, like working with a food NGO, and seeing how people view people in uniform. So kind of like my own listening project, it's, it's how I, Tina let me spend spring break in Haiti. So I escaped from my day job to go down there. It was a very, very rich experience. Um, I, I, I saw that early on, that picture of handing out food. You know, that's just one context. We started throwing food at people. And so what happens when you throw food? People start trampling folks. And our, and our folks who are in those fragile spheres, so, so females, sorry ladies, you're not really fragile, but fragile spheres, right? You know, the mom, the mom with two kids, elderly, um, mentally, and physically handicapped. They get trampled. They don't. They don't get their share. It's not an organized distribution. The security officer at the World Food Program said, "It's better to let a community starve another day than to do something to hand out food in a way that would injure or hurt someone, or, or worse yet, overburden uh, a lady with the, the corn sorghum blend and the oil and the salt and the bags, and she's walking on the way home, and people see her. They take her food and they sexually assault her. You can get over." being hungry for another day, it's pretty hard to get over, I would guess, being sexually assaulted. So set it up, have community leaders involved. That's the do no harm piece. That's very important. I'll just, I'll just leave with a couple of um, random thoughts or rants maybe. Um, you're an instrument, you in uniform are an instrument of US foreign policy. That, that's what you're doing. Now in your heart, you may be feeling very, very humanitarian, but we can never truly be uh, a humanitarian organization. So. So just be careful how you how you engage. Um, humanitarian. Uh, think about the core principles: humanity, impartiality, independence, and neutrality. Those offer access. They offer security for those humanitarian actors. And we don't want to do anything that might impinge them. And it may be like I'm like, hey, someone from Interaction, you know, picture of me in uniform with Yoni. Well, Yoni doesn't. It doesn't happen. Nothing bad happens to him. But what if he has a member of his organization in a place that has very questionable security? Oh, yeah, you with that shirt. I saw a picture of one of your folks with one of the Gringos in uniform. You're working for the U.S. government. So really, you know, 
what do we do? So think about, that's what I'm saying, think philosophically, think strategically as you act tactically. Um, you know, know your role and the, and the assistance you can offer. It's really, uh, we, can, we use three terms. We have direct, we have indirect, and we have infrastructure support. So you talk about the wholesale and retail. We should, infrastructure support's awesome, indirect. If it's direct, we only need to be doing that if there's, if there's a huge gap in capacity. So if there's something like, like why do I get invited to these things? Helicopters, right? I mean, they're to ride in, but they're also terrain independent. So, but when that capacity exists, either in the local community, they can move stuff, or uh, the civilian community can, can bring in their own helicopters, we need to go away. Um, you know, keep your footprint small. Think about these folks, they're recipients, they're not victims, they have dignity. So throwing food, we throw food at animals, we don't throw food at people. You can still help them and allow them to retain their dignity. Don't discount local knowledge and local know-how. It, it's, 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 it's richer than you'll ever guess. Remember you're a guest of the host nation. The host nation owns that problem. You may have a really, really good idea, and we had some decent ideas in Pakistan. I never presented it. I gave the PowerPoints to the, the Pakistani um, military guy who's kind of running the, the, the helicopter operations. And he presented it his own idea. Think about how much better that was embraced than if it came from big Ringo, who's kind of invading next door anyways, right? So much MSF actually came. They like stood at the tent door, you know, and they wouldn't go in, but they saw what we were looking at. It was it was it was some methodologies for deconflicting aircraft because we had some incidents, and you don't you don't help people by running aircraft into each other. Um, uh, you know, you can you can positively or neg neg negatively impact humanitarian space, and that's uh, that's something that we talked about. You hear that term? Look look it up. You know, humanitarian space is it gives them access to populations. These humanitarian groups access to populations also uh, impacts on their security. We have weapons. We're all armored up. We're good on security. But what about the folks that don't? You know, think about that. And then uh, lastly. When we go someplace, we're always teaching like, oh, shake, you know, shake with this hand, don't do this, don't do that, don't bow. I mean, I don't, we, we like over bow, don't you think? We're like, we're not bowing to everybody. There's probably a lot of people around the world that are like, what is wrong with these people? Um, <laughs> but you know, th that, that culture is the one we get. The culture you need to really work on understanding is all those other actors that are there to help that probably aren't from that place. So I'll just kind of rant completely. <laughs> Thank you, Colonel Hobson. Uh, next, we have uh, Sean Horgan. Sean Horgan is the uh, Region 1 Administrator, for, uh, which is New England, for uh, Team Rubicon, which is a uh, veterans, uh, uh, Veteran initi Initiative Disaster Res uh, Response Program, um, which actually began through the, the earthquake in Haiti in 2010. Um, and Sean Horgan is also a, uh, a former um, a Marine Corps platoon sergeant, and uh, we're really excited to have uh, Mr. Horgan here. So. Uh, any Marines are in the audience? Just want to see how outnumbered I actually am. <laughs> Zero. Uh, any in the Navy? People who take us places? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, top Gun back there? What's going on with the glasses? Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the, so, what Team Rubicon is in our history is actually quite a bit different from uh, some of the other folks in here. So, um, I'll give a little bit of that, but just a little bit about myself. Um, a background in computer science, software engineering. Uh, I also, for some reason, decided to be a machine gunner and a tow gunner in the Marines. Uh, just couldn't quite figure out that path I wanted to do in life. So um, I deployed uh, to Iraq and Fallujah in 2005 and 2006. And uh, like many folks, when I got done with that experience, I got back. And I would left the Marines at that time. And I was looking for uh, uh, what was next in my life. To get that sense of purpose. I came back to a software company, started writing. Uh, software, managing teams in that context, uh, which, was a, which was fun and fulfilling, but it certainly didn't compare to that experience I had while I was in Iraq. Um, and it's something I just want to, I think is a really big takeaway for folks here, because I think most people here will be in leadership positions in the military. And regardless of whether you spend four years or 20 or 30 years in the military, um, when you're in a leadership capacity, everyone that's basically under your charge is someone you really have responsibility for the rest of your life. It's not just as soon as you take off your uniform or when they leave your unit. Um, those are people that you will know and connect with throughout. And that's not something I really appreciated uh, until I got back, until 
you know, uh, we're facing our 10 year anniversary from when our platoon uh, went to Iraq and just that time just disappeared. And we've got Facebook groups, we get together once in a while, we talk about friends we lost, uh, our experiences there. And uh, it, the folks, in, as you left, you tend to stay at that rank when you leave. You end up, like I left as a staff sergeant, you kind of are a staff sergeant for life then. And you're, you're, you're Lance Corporals and your corporals as they grow up and maybe they're running companies or, or what have you. You, you tend to share that, 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 that same type of structure that, uh, throughout the rest of your life. And that's something that's really important to understand that, you know, whether you're a first lieutenant uh, or a colonel, uh, your team will look to you uh, throughout the rest of your life to, to help keep them together, connect them, uh, be a source, be a reference. So that's something I think that uh, is especially is at the heart of what Team Rubicon does. So for folks who don't know about Team Rubicon, it was started uh, basically in response to the, Haiti in, in, uh, to the earthquake in Haiti in 2010. Jake Wood was someone who had uh, recently come back from Iraq himself. He was in the process of figuring out what was going on next for him. He was looking at MBA programs. Um, the earthquake happened. He was watching the devastation on, on TV. He wanted to help. He had that same sense of, uh, of wanting to give back. But he couldn't. He was uh, talking to a lot of the traditional um, NGOs, uh, government uh, institutions, and wasn't hearing back. He was basically told to go to our donor page and, and, and send us money. Um, and which, you know, uh, Jake, a former Marine Scout sniper, that wasn't the right answer. So he wanted to get involved. And so he uh, connected with some people on Facebook and said, Who's with me? And so he found another Marine, Will McNulty, out of uh, DC, who, who signed up. Uh, well, Will McNulty, a uh, former tow gunner, and uh, he spent a bunch of time in, uh, in intelligence, had some connections with the State Department, was able to get himself and Jake down to, um, uh, down to the Dominican Republic and use some connections. Uh, and as they went along, they basically found people who were compelled uh, in the same way and uh, had a small team of eight people that were able to cross the border and get into Haiti. And they didn't really have much of a plan, they just wanted to help. Um, uh, that was really where Team Rubicon uh, started. That's got its founding. That's where the name comes from, the Rubicon, when Caesar crossed that. I guess now it's just a very small puddle of a, of a back in the day, it was a pretty significant river uh, to really signify that they, they were just uh, uh, challenging the current uh, status quo of disaster response and wanted to help out. And it was very naive. Um, and I think in some cases, I think we've learned a lot since then, but um, they just didn't want to wait around to be told what to do. I think that was touched on from some of your kind of, uh, points, Mike, just around uh, there isn't a whole lot of coordination of volunteers. And one of the worst things that a lot of volunteer organizations can get themselves into is they get there and they become casualties themselves because they aren't prepared. Well, that's one of the things that you go with a, a team led by a scout sniper, they can pretty much handle themselves. Um, uh, and that was one of the issues that we were looking at Haiti, uh, trying to deconflict uh, things that they were here seeing on the news about there being chaos and then being told from other organizations that things are fine, that the, hey, the response is rolling, don't worry about it, we don't need you. Uh, so they wanted to go there themselves and figure out what was happening. As they, uh, they, and they really activated uh, their social media context and started to, to build awareness, and they actually got a, quite a bit of funding from um, uh, grassroots people. I mean, this is back in 2010, which now is, uh, feels like a lifetime ago. But people really wanted to help them, and they were giving back through photos, through, through sharing their stories, letting them know what happened on the ground, which was something that wasn't being done by a lot of order, other organizations. So from that experience, um, uh, when they wrapped up, they thought, "Hey, listen, this is a, this is a club. You know, there's a handful of people here. We'll help out, uh, but we'll, you know, this isn't something we're going to do full time." And they contacted their donors, and like, and they said, "You know, we didn't use all your money. Uh, we actually were able to get by pretty thinly." Um, and they wanted to give it back. And then, but the response that got back from the donors was like, no, you guys did great things down here. Uh, we want you to continue to do that. So that's what they did. That's what they decided to form Team Rubicon as an organization. And they responded to uh, uh, the earthquakes and the flooding in Pakistan and in Chile. And they kept very much a very international focus uh, until the um, tornado uh, that touched down in Joplin, Missouri. And just, just to see what would happen, they just uh, hit Facebook, hit the, the social networks, and said, we need help here from the veteran population. And they were just overwhelmed by the response there. And that was really a, a hallmark, that uh, was a turning event for the organization where um, they really understood that the, the, what, they, what Team Rubicon was doing was really solving two problems with each other. Um, they had this sense of, uh, this need to get a sense of purpose beyond what they've done in the military. Because it's very easy, you know, you join the military, you deploy places, you know, there's parades, there's ribbons, there's ceremonies, and you come back, people will walk on the street will walk up to you and shake your hand. But that once that experience is done, there's really nothing else like that in life. So that's something they were looking for, that sense of purpose. 
uh, that sense of connection with the local community. Um, and uh, what they were seeing is that, in, especially nationally, when these uh, disasters happened, um, there was still a lot of unmet need. And when they went out to the community and explained their story and what they were there to do, and the fact that they actually weren't charging for money, because I think this is something that not a lot of folks know about, but in the, especially on the domestic side, when you know uh, the storm radar goes off uh, with, the, with the local news stations, uh, folks just from all over the country will pour into that, like contractors and folks maybe with not the best intent. Um, and see that as a money-making opportunity, right, where they can get in there and uh, uh, sell their services to help with the debris cleanup. There's, and we've seen this ourselves. There's a lot of um, not so great local politics where local politicians are serving uh, as basically um, uh, to enable some of these uh, uh, corporate interests to get involved with some of the cleanup, like knocking down entire neighborhoods and getting that stuff to the curb takes a lot of work. And uh, Team Mobile Commons there to show up and start doing that work for free. And that was something that wasn't really happening in a lot of other contexts. So uh, Joplin, Missouri was a big event for us where we really connected and we saw the power of uh, veterans and what it gave to them. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, we started to do is we started to run these operations just like we ran operations in the military. We have uh, an agreement with every Home Depot in the country where we own a small corner of their parking lot. And we set up a little Ford operating base with tents, a uh, place to keep our gear. Uh, we have uh, we keep a flag there that we do reveille and uh, uh, we raise and lower the colors every day. Uh, we get together to talk about what the experience has meant to us, um, and just uh, it, it's, it connects a lot of the ceremonies and the things that we have done in the military, um, and it shows us that we're actually doing this stuff out in the community. Um, and that's another element too. Uh, Team Rubicon isn't just an organization that focuses purely on veterans. We have about 80% veterans, about 20% civilians or first responders. In fact, one of the civilians is in the audience today, Dana Braverman, who we found uh, through a team, Red, White, and Blue, which is another veterans organization that focuses on fitness. Found her a couple of years ago. Uh, she is someone who uh, has the same sense of service that the rest of us uh, who had served in the military have as well. Uh, she chose a different path in her life. And uh, what are those that road came together um, uh, for, for both of us a few years ago, where she wanted to get back as well. and. Um, her skill set, it was something that we very much needed in Team Rubicon. We have a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of Marines, a lot of machine gunners, a lot of good people who are good at breaking big things, <coughs> small things, and carrying them away. Um, what we don't have is a lot of great people who have a lot of technical capabilities um, uh, in terms of spreadsheets and organizing themselves. And, but those are skill sets that we absolutely need as well, too. Um, so we just definitely have home for, for that. And that's actually one of the key ingredients, uh, from my experience with Team Rubicon, is uniting people from that, um, who share that same DNA of service. And one of the things that Jake, when they started the organization, um, there was a sense to keep it really small, a lot of, kind of tight-knit, more elite units who could go in there and you know handle themselves without a whole lot of coordination. Um, but that didn't really feel like a great veterans uh, integration project, because we were just basically, all the political boys are back in town again and working with each other and then disbanding. And they weren't creating some of those ties um, that could help them uh, transition back into the community itself. And I think that's one of the great things about Team Rubicon is that you'll be working alongside someone who's a firefighter, an EMS, or someone like a Dana, um, who, who you share that same sense of like, we want to help and we we're willing to, to stop what everything else is going on in our lives uh, to, to achieve some of that. So, um, I'll fast forward, I also want to touch on a little bit around Hurricane Sandy. So um, at this point then, uh, I think Sandy was in 2012. And so Team Rubicon had done a, a couple of small operations around the country. Um, it was still suffering from a kind of a lack of awareness and some funding issues. Uh, but Sandy was a uh, call to action. Um, we, uh, we showed up there immediately. There's a great veteran population in the Northeast and in, uh, in the New York City area. And uh, it just shined a spotlight on one of the key problems in disaster response, uh, especially nationally, is spontaneous volunteer management. A lot of people show up, but no one wants to help them. Like, if you show up to the fire station, they got stuff to deal with, right? Um, Team Rubicon stepped up. That was one of the key values that, uh, or experiences that veterans provide is managing a lot of people, right? I had a platoon of 44 Marines uh, when I was in Iraq, and it was across a lot of different specialties. You know, uh, machine gunners, um, uh, to mechanics, to uh, to you name it, and you're just used to having you know, the normal conflict. I'll break that down into four, three or four squads. Each squad has five team leaders, 
uh, you have NCOs, you just have to, you just know how to handle accountability, making sure people get their, their food and they will get a place to sleep. You can just basically take that sergeant or that corporal and put them in charge of a group of maybe 30 civilians who have shown up to help and say, go to this neighborhood and figure it out. And that's the end of the coordination. And you know that that sergeant or that corporal or that lieutenant, uh, the lieutenant will probably need a sergeant with him. Uh, you can go out there and actually get that done. So, um, so that, that's, Sandy really proved that we were effective in doing that. Another element of Sandy is that you know, folks saw that and they just dropped a lot of, um, this is a segue to some things you'll cover, dropped a lot of technology and donations on us. You know, we had uh, groups like Palantir, which you know, had provides a lot of software to, uh, to the, the Defense Department, to the, the three letter agencies, um, showed up and says, we want to help here as well. And uh, that was another place where we could take some skill sets around disaster assessments, you know, land navigation and, and, and intelligence gathering that the military has, and put that to practical use and, and feed that information. That was one of our products uh, to some of the local governments in uh, the New York area. And it's been something consistently across a lot of the other uh, responses that we have. So we'll show up, we'll do disaster assessments, we'll have very uh, high fidelity uh, uh, maps drawn up that, uh, that the local government may not be able to get to quickly and enable them to plot that out. I believe that uh, I spent some time in Washington, Illinois, and it was around this time last year, around over Thanksgiving, and uh, we were basically producing the assets that all the other organizations in that local area were using to, to map out and how to manage uh, the actual response itself. Um, a couple more things to, to touch on. So we did have that, um, that period where we started out on the international front at a very small level. We then transitioned in 2012 and 2013 to a real focus on scaling the organization from eight up to you know 10,000, 15. We're now at about 20,000 volunteers. We really just focused on the domestic operations and just trying to understand like how to speak to speak. So we started transitioning from using SMEACs, five paragraph orders, and all the terminology we all could basically recite uh, in our sleep from the military background into what FEMA requires in terms of the, the incident command structure, uh, NIMS, and everything else. So basically. Uh, to your point, Colonel, uh, to learn the language of disaster response nationally. And that's been a big focus for us in making sure that all the leadership team understands what those courses are, how to speak to the different organizations. Uh, we've actually surprised ourselves that when we've shown up to many of these responses, we're the, we're the ones that actually practice it the most because we have that military mindset. Like someone gives us a, a, a manual, we actually, for the most part, read it. Um, so we're pretty good at doing what we're told uh, in many ways. Um, so, uh, in 2013, um, uh, folks here have touched on that already, is the, the uh, typhoon in the Philippines. Um, that was uh, uh, something we were not planning for, like in, in most disaster response organizations. We were pretty happy with how things were going on the domestic front, and this thing happened. And uh, I remember uh, the sign that Jake had pulled, uh, printed out and had basically pasted all over the offices in LA, which is make bold decisions. And he was just empowering the local teams to figure out how we wanted to respond to that. And uh, they basically, folks, as soon as that storm, they knew it was going to hit the Philippines, they started making phone calls and said, can you go to Haiti? And so we had a team assembled, I think of about a dozen people, um, who got there second. I think there was a group um, of doctors who were on their way to South America and basically turned their plane towards uh, uh, the Philippines. But we showed up there and we just uh, got to work. And I think the, the, the byline in Tubum County has bridged the gap. And we're constantly there looking to find where we can help out, where the gaps are. And we have a lot of, um, and this is where uh, it touches on some of the other the, the conversation elements here, is that uh, military-civilian divide, uh, or that those connections that we have while we're uh, in the deployment phase. Um, you know, we have a lot of folks who have a lot of experience on the logistical side, the operational side. If we see that it's a military plane, we know who to talk to generally to get our way on there, which is, is good for us in some ways. It also is bad when we deal with other NGOs and folks who are like, how do those guys get on the plane? Uh, so we, we, uh, we, there are some missteps absolutely in the Philippines and how we um, uh, approach certain elements of that stuff. But overall, we got there quickly. Uh, we learned a lot um, about how to respond internationally at scale because uh, traditionally there were small teams there at, uh, for the, the Philippines. Uh, most of the headquarters elements left LA and set up in Manila. Manila. We had uh, 10s, 20s, we set up an entire uh, uh, disaster, sorry, uh, uh, a medical team that was primarily staffed from personal friends who were physicians who needed uh, trust with an organization that they knew like Team Rubicon to go there. Um, uh, we learned very quickly that there were large uh, uh, 
medical organizations going to help out. They set up these tent cities of, of, of doctors and they expected, uh, they were hoping a lot of locals would make their way there. What we learned was uh, that that wasn't the case. They were afraid to leave their homes because either the homes would get robbed, they would get robbed on the way there, they would get to this hospital and they may have to pay for that treatment. So they just didn't understand um, how to even get that care. So we just did what we did in, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, we just got in patrols, right? We sent small teams out there with doctors and nurses and patrolled into the neighborhoods and tried to deliver care where it was needed, um, which was, uh, again, one of the gaps that we were search uh, searching for. Um, at a couple of weeks into the operation in uh, the Philippines, what we had learned was that the, the big organizations that showed up, they were basically uh, manning the effort there and that our time there really wasn't, uh, we weren't, starting to become duplicative, and it was time for us to basically come back to the U.S. And so that ended our uh, operations in the Philippines. I guess we've got the notes passed around. Right? Is this something that says, please, uh, please wrap this up? You're <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I want to take that note there quite literally and wrap up, but the, um, but the transition in 2014 uh, has been focusing, again, mostly on some of the, uh, uh, the domestic operations. But we've transitioned from managing a lot of those through the headquarters office in LA down to running those things in the region. So um, like when the uh, hurricane touched, sorry the hurricane, but when the that, uh, tornado touched down in Revere, we uh, managed a couple of uh, weekends and week-long work projects in the local area staffed by local veterans and first responders here in uh, the Boston area. So that's been basically the evolution from see where we from where it started in Haiti, some international stuff, and really breaking these operations down to very much you know, a local level and making better connections Thank you very much, Mr. Morgan. And uh, finally, we have Ms. Misha Shattuck joining us today from MIT Lincoln Lab. Uh, Misha, Misha Shattuck was involved in the, uh, the joint uh, MIT Harvard team that responded to the, uh, the Haiti earthquake in January 2010, and in 2013 also coordinated uh, a code sprint that focused on the Syrian conflict to better support the humanitarian response community. She, uh, recently, she organized two uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief workshops focusing on technology solutions. Uh, and is a public health professional with a master's in science and global health from Trinity College in Ireland. Uh, everyone, uh, here's uh, Ms. Misha Shai. So it's actually my mom who is in the room, so please laugh at my jokes, and if you need to at any point gasp in like complete and utter awe of the intelligence that I have brought from you, I'm very Oh my gosh, you <laughs> said that. Go a long way. Um, so about, briefly about Lincoln Laboratory, we are a part of MIT, we are MIT's largest laboratory with over 3,500 staff. Our staff are scientists, researchers, and technologists, but what's unique about Lincoln Laboratory is we are a federally funded research and development center, so we're the part of MIT that only works for the U.S. government, and we particularly, we work for the Department of Defense. And the type of work that we do is work that nobody else can do. If somebody else can build it, if somebody else can prove a concept, they should be doing it. So the government reserves and the DOD reserve Lincoln Laboratory to tackle really difficult technology problems. Um, so it's a fantastic place to work. Uh, I really, really like it. Uh, one of the things that happens when you work on what we call wicked problems and not like the Boston like wicked smart. Not that type of wicked problem, but a wicked problem in terms of where do you even start? So a good example would be we just developed a laser that can speak. It's a satellite laser communication system that we put a satellite orbiting the moon and we communicated over 30 days. Uh, if you are a scientific person, it was about 800 um, MVPs per second, and we didn't have a single drop in 30 days. So we're the type of people who prove really complicated things can be done. We don't build, we don't mass produce anything. We just get this first concept off the ground. One of the things that happens when you build this type of technology, the systems approach you have to take. You have to really understand all the problems, the requirements, what goes into making this work? Why hasn't it worked before? 
that type of thinking we can leverage onto problems that aren't necessarily a strictly technology issue. And it's that approach why Lincoln Laboratory is now working in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. But as I mentioned, as a federally funded research and development center, we are not HADR operators or implementers. We support the US government. And again, primarily the DOD, but we also have the opportunity to support other parts of the USG that work in disaster response. From my personal background, I had the opportunity to work in Haiti. Uh, and did, we did a multi-sector needs assessment. We did that at the request of Lieutenant General Ken Keene, who is the Joint Task Force Commander in Haiti, because General Keene just didn't feel like he, he had a lot of strategic information. He wasn't getting a lot of tactical information. And it turns out in disaster response, there are hundreds of assessments that are happening simultaneously. Different NGOs are doing them, IGOs, so international governmental organizations are doing it, the host nation government are doing them. But so far, nobody has cracked a nut on how to synthesize all of this information. And there's a lot of latency when organizations share their data and the fidelity to which they share it. From a scientific perspective, one of the difficulties when you look at multiple data streams, particularly when you have something like a needs assessment, Organizations are very reluctant to share their methodology. If you don't understand a methodology, this is the MIT part where you're all very impressed. <laughs> if you don't understand the methodology of how somebody collected data, you cannot make accurate assumptions on that data. I can't build you a model that's gonna be predictive or I can't build you a retrospective model that can outline trends unless you understand the methodology. So General Keene said, I need something that's multi-sector, that covers a lot of different facets, that's gonna help give actually tactical information. <coughs> the great thing about General Keene on that particular decision he made was he said, I'd like you to work with the cluster system, work with the IGOs, the NGOs, work with the host nation to come up with this assessment because he wanted this assessment to feed back into not just his decision making, but the decision making as a coordination tool to have this like baseline that everybody could look at um, as a coordination tool for the wider humanitarian response community. Which leads me to one of the big things that I'd like to briefly talk about, and that is the humanitarian response community. We've, because of the nature of this audience, we have a lot of uh, members of the military, so thank you for that, but we also have our Tufts community here. And unless you are planning on enlisting after, after you finish school, you will, if you decide to get in this, you'll most likely work for the UN, or you could work for USAID or an NGO. This is the community that goes to disasters. Your military colleagues will come to about 10% of disasters. That's a really important distinction. When the military comes, you bring tremendous assets and capabilities that the humanitarian response community, they don't have because they can't afford them. Uh, so thank you for bringing your toys. They are genuinely appreciated at the time. But the humanitarians, this is a profession. This is what people are investing their lives in. These are the people that when the military, I'm so pleased to learn about allies and what you're doing, because I can easily see in 15 years, you guys being in some godforsaken country that has just had a devastating event. You were saying, didn't we meet at Tufts? <laughs> But I encourage the members of the military to remember that the expertise in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief is on the civilian side. It doesn't mean you're not good at it, that you're not brilliant at it. And as Colonel Thompson said, you can't be great at it. I encourage you to be great at it, but you will be great at it by leveraging the expertise and the professional history and capacity of the civilian population who, again, it is a profession. I think the military, you often get branded as these men and women who are brash and they come and they kick down the doors. So there's this stereotype of who you are. 
the military can also have a very big stereotype of these humanitarians who are just these do-gooders who are like hugging trees on our off time and like saving babies <laughs> during our working hours. But it turns out we are all professionals who study at what we do, who work to be more disciplined, who work to make our next deployment, whether that is a deployment to a development site or a humanitarian site or another deployment, as our military colleagues in the room, to the war theater. But please, I strongly encourage you to kind of recognize that professionalism. One of the things that the military has done much better, and you've heard it, I am echoing every one of these speakers, that the relationship is getting better. The concept of like winning hearts and minds, you can actually see that, how the military is now interacting with their colleagues in the humanitarian sector. An example of this would be uh, in Haiti, I saw a civil affairs colonel who came into actually a very hostile uh, cluster meeting in Haiti because there had been a miscommunication of what somebody assumed um, the military was going to do something, the military didn't, people were pissed off. This colonel came into a room and just his physical posture, for one, he got down on the ground and was kind of looking up at them. The way he, he spoke softly, he wasn't loud. He was absolutely brilliant and I happened to ride back with him and I said, you know, wow, that, that's not my opinion of the military. And he said, no, I learned that being in Afghanistan of when you're meeting with village elders. He said, these humanitarians, they are the village elders <coughs> of this community. This is the buy-in um, that we, we need. My personal research interests and what I do being at Lincoln Laboratory is I'm really interested in technology. Technology is one of the ways to bridge a gap between the host nation, which is something that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about today, but truly the first responders are the host nation. They are the people before any of us get in the room, it is neighbors digging out neighbors out of their homes. The host nation, that is their population, it is their family. And they will, the host nation government will be responsible for this long after you leave. Technology is a way to connect with them. Technology is a way to connect and to collaborate, oh, not collaborate. Here's a thing you learn in disaster response and humanitarian assistance. Language is terribly important. We don't use the word, and I learned this yesterday, you don't use the word collaborate because a lot of humanitarians, it turns out it's more than Americans who do this. Uh, Europeans, the word collaborate has very strong uh, historical, it's like a historically charged word based on World War II. If you are a collaborator, you are working with the Nazis. Who knew? Just as Dr. Shear was saying yesterday, do not refer to humanitarians as force multipliers. No, you will not make friends at all uh, in that sense. But my point was, in terms of technology, you can use it to coordinate. That is an okay word. I have to ask my humanitarian colleagues here. But technology really can bridge the gap between different institutions. I hate to burst the bubble if you have not had the opportunity to go into a job during um, a humanitarian crisis. You think that the military is just going to bring amazing assets, that it is just going to be screens and all sorts of like really amazing tech, and you walk in and it's like four guys building a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> on their computers and they're all running on Internet Explorer. Um, that's <laughs> So it turns out that the humanitarians oftentimes have cooler technology, you have much more amazing assets, military friends, but your humanitarian colleagues actually have really cool technology uh, that you can leverage, that you can pull from. Uh, and truly, like in a disaster response, other than the capabilities like heavy airlift, a lot of times it is the humanitarian community is feeding you information rather than vice versa. I think we think because some of the assets that the military has, that the military is 
providing a lot of intel. That's actually another word you don't want to use um, in disaster response, but providing a lot of information. Uh, but it really is coming from the other direction. One last thing I would like to talk about. Um, you will be amazed at the effect that the media has on how a disaster response goes. Everybody is competing for media attention. The military wants it, USAID wants it, because once the military arrives, you dwarf in terms of how many of you there are as well as all of the NGOs desperately want the media. This has nothing to do with technology, but this does have something to do of, if you are in an NGO, if you are working for the government, if you are a member of the military forces, please be aware that you are being watched. And in a day of a 24-hour news media cycle, as well as social media, nothing you say Unless in the military, if you were in a classified space, then knock yourselves out. Complain all you want about the humanitarians behind closed doors. But if you are in a cluster meeting, if you are just walking around, I highly encourage you to think, I hope your parents had this lecture with you before you went off to university of like, whatever goes on Facebook will stay forever, so don't be an idiot. The same thing applies in these disaster situations because there is such a big media presence. Um, and that is my big sister advice that really has nothing to do with my team in the laboratory. Uh, but it's something that nobody else mentioned that I thought I would. Because of the lack of time, I'm going to lead a breakout session later where I'll be talking more about certain technologies that exist um, and certain kind of trends of technology, but I'll leave that for, for the talk afterwards. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rashad. Uh, again, in the interest of time, uh, I would like to open up the, uh, the floor to, to questions directly from the audience for the, the panelists, and uh, um, we really, really, I'm really looking forward to hearing what people have to say. Or we've said it. Yeah. Um, go ahead. If you can introduce yourself, that'd be great. Sir Ken Santos. Excuse me. Excuse me. Colonel Thompson, so we, uh, we mentioned a lot about the push-pull concept in terms of the resources people need on the ground and the resources the military can provide. Is there a way you can like, address tactically how we address for that and uh, how we can really help our colleagues in that matter? You mean as, as far as introducing assets into... In terms of how, how do you best use the assets we can provide in the military and not mm -hmm. become dependent or not have uh, NGOs and non-military become dependent? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. We're, we are going to be requested to provide something, and it's, you know, typically, uh, you know, we're not the first ones there. So we'll be asked to provide, you know, aircraft, engineer equipment, uh, telecommunications. Uh, we provided, we had a lot of imagery and maps that we provided for everybody in Pakistan. We have better imagery than the Pakistanis, which <coughs> made them a little nervous. But, uh, you know. um, the... The, the thing that you do have to watch out for is, is the dependencies. And, and folks, a good example is the, the World Food Program in Haiti. Their forklift was broke. And the Air Force lent them their forklift. Because uh, as, we, as uh, uh, we heard last night, you know, they, they come, like a couple of guys and a, and, a, and a table and a radio are now the you know, ground control and tower at Fort Prince International. Right? Um, so they, we lent them a, a forklift. The World Food Program guys, when I was going around interviewing people and chit-chatting, they said, would you please tell the Air Force to take their forklift away? Because until we lose that capacity, our bosses, our leaders in the World Food Program won't give us the money to get the parts to fix our own forklift. So we even can create dependencies within the, the community, the other actors that are there. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like the leadership thing, it's a little art and science. Uh, you, you've got to know, the, the minute you get there, you've got to start working yourself out of a job. You've got to become relevant as fast as possible. And, and some of that may, may be just you seeing that. If, if you're talking to, to a, um, you know, someone else on the ground and working with them, and you see that, that what you're doing, that capacity exists, or, or, or worse yet, you're providing something 
that folks could be paying a local national to provide, and now you've negatively impacted their livelihood, stop doing that. So, you know, some of the, hey, people take free chicken all day, right? So it's kind of up to you to, to try to help this engage. Can I touch on that? Because that is really the focus of what OCHA does and, and the problem. And the biggest problem is that when militaries are getting their order to be prepared to deploy, that's the exact time that the information in country and in the disaster is lacking. So when politicians are making decisions on deploying military assets, it's when there's not, the assessments haven't been conducted, things haven't been organized on the ground, so a lot of time decisions are being made without full information. So generally, I'm not pointing at any one nation, uh, but they send what's available or what's proximal rather than what is really needed. There is a model out there, and it's the Canadian model. Um, they have a disaster assistance response team that is military that's modularized. So they send an assessment team out on the ground immediately that advises the ministers back in Ottawa and saying, yes, the Canadian military can provide some assistance. But the modules can be structured, they can be taken away, they can be expanded, but it's engineering, health, logistics, water purification, um, security, a control mechanism, and it deploys based on what the needs are on the ground. The U.S. has that prepackaged, it's called the Marine Expeditionary Unit, generally in proximity in, in different areas. So, I mean, there are ways to do it, but sending everything that you've got available or proximal is never the good solution. It's sending what is actually needed on the ground. I'm going to take one final stab at this and talk about the tactical tool. Dr. Shear mentioned it yesterday. There is a tactical tool called MITAM, Mission Tasking Matrix which is the on the ground, no shit, this is your mission. Fly these pallets from point A to point B, consign them to the person, here's the lap long, and here's his phone number. And it's the tool that you'll find referenced in the JTF Commander's Handbook. It was referenced last night, it's actually an OFTA tool. We've developed it to provide exactly that. It's essentially an air support, an air, an air support system request process that allows the mission to be defined, filtered up, racked and stacked in the JTF in terms of priorities, usually about 72 hours ahead of time. That's at the tactical level. Operation of those where you're going to get the challenge. Because you're going to get a broad mission set. Chances are it'll be logistics. Maybe you might include some water. If that's it, don't send the field hospital. Don't send, you know, if it's not, a rope, if it's not water, don't send the rope pubes. Don't send the aircraft carrier. Right? If the MEB or the MEF can come down and they have the helos, that's it. We don't need everybody. And that's the hard part, is limiting it at that level. So, to distinctions that I want to make and also just reference to the to the talk last night. The DART is managing Poland government, disaster assistance response team, the US DART, civilian platform, different than the Canadian DART, which is a military platform, not as scalable as the US one. We talked about a HAST. DOD does have a capacity called the Humanitarian Assistance Survey Team. It's a platform that exists to support the US military's mission, not to do a broad needs assessment of all humanitarian needs. So to that end, there's going to be some tactical check questions that arise. Do I need uh, MHG, material handling equipment, in order to support the mission, which is going to be logistics? That's an internal DOD decision. Or am I providing MHG to support the humanitarian community because I've assessed that they don't have enough? That's an external decision. What goes on to support one's own mission, to achieve mission success based on how the mission is crafted, is not going to be defined by us, by the civilians or by the UN. We're going to give you the broad contours and then let you pick and choose what you need in order to meet that mission. So that's how that's going to look operationally on the ground. Um, but keep that in mind that, that what you decide, even in terms of food and water to, for troop sustainment, is not going to come from an external source. But that might impact the humanitarian environment, say in Haiti, where large numbers of troops require a lot of daily lift of food and water. Well, that then limits what's coming in in terms of medical and shelter and other stuff for beneficiaries. So that's going to be the challenge. That's why it's a, a <coughs> interesting, wicked problem set on the ground. So I think we're out of time, uh, but we'll have more time for discussion with the panelists in the uh, breakout sessions uh, that are coming right after the break.